As a filmmaker with a concern for human rights and a background in youth work, I find the Philippines compelling. What confounds me about this country is that although it is rich with resources, for a majority of Filipinos, being rich is a distant dream. So what we got here is we've got a family living here uh, underneath this umbrella on the streets of Manila. Their worldly possessions, uh, everything you see here and everything you see over there. Originally, May thought she was going to get work uh, in Japan as an entertainer or an erotic dancer many years ago, but she got ripped off and she's found herself here. She originally comes from an island called Mindanao, which she cannot return to because she cannot afford to get there. Ironically enough, these are some of the luckier people who live on the streets of Manila. Over the last six years, I have frequently visited the Philippines and been consistently frustrated by the sad realities here. From the thousands of families living on garbage dumps to the sex industry that continues to thrive here. So give me a general overview of what will happen in an average night. How does it, how does it actually operate here? Most of them are dancers. They also tabled with customers. Okay. So do any of you have ambitions other than being dancers? Yeah, they, they, they wanted to go back to school. Go back to school? If yeah. they have money. They were the, the, only, the only members of their household making money? Most of them. Wow. Those kids, I look like kids I used to teach religious instruction to in year seven. All they lacked was a little blue uniform. Ah, oh, it's just... Just beyond words, in my opinion, anyway. Despite numerous visits, the lack of progress in the Philippines never ceases to shock me. But the greatest shock in my Philippines experience actually came from myself. Two years ago, in May 2007, I thought I had found a response to the injustice I had witnessed here. An unorthodox attempt to cut to the heart of the issues of inequality. Here we are for the May 2007 midterm elections in the Philippines. As they say in the classics, always expect the unexpected here in this country. I became a foreign election observer. What the hell was I thinking? As political analysts gathered from around the world in Manila for the briefing, I became acutely aware that my makeshift cameraman Woody and myself were not really qualified as election observers. Not that we didn't get on with the others. Hey, I'm walking here. <laughs> <laughs> Annie. Annie what? Annie Lee. Uh, it's my name, Annie Lee. Annie Lee from Germany. It was just that I was there ready to rip into these politicians whom I held responsible for the Filipina situation. And our role description seemed a bit, well, bland. Our job description as foreign election observers could be best summarized in three guidelines. One, interview political candidates. Two, monitor voter freedom. And three, document irregularities. But I should not have been worried about the elections being planned. And this is made by, this one here is by churches. Like most people around the world, my knowledge of Filipino politics was limited to the military dictator Ferdinand Marcos, whose oppressive 20 year reign ended in 1986. But far from settling down, elections have continued to be violent power grabs. Each election is light on political debate and discourse. Instead, Filipinos will tell you that their elections consist of the three G's. Guns, goons, and gold. And whoever has the most of these are generally the winners. After three days of briefing in Manila, Woody and I were assigned a team and a province. 
ours was the rural province of Nueva Ecija, and our team was therefore christened Team Nueva Ecija. Nueva Ecija, good luck boys. Here we are, we're on our way to um, our hot spot, which we're going to look at, um, and we're going to actually do some observing for the election. Now, the name of this place is... Nueva Ecija. No, we're to Nasita. <laughs> no, we're to Nasita. No. We're going to Nueva Ecija. No. No. This is Nueva. Nueva. No T. Nueva. See, Nu. Nu. Where? Where? Va. Va. E. E. Si. Si. Ha. That's where we're going. But this is Iona. Iona is our beautiful hostess with the mostess and she's going to take us around and show us stuff and really yeah well actually um, i'll be documenting what's what the team will be doing it's going to be some people from wherever is uh the local um, residents there who will be showing us around since they they're more familiar with the area Lars. I feel about, uh, exciting about it. Uh, not that excited about ambushing and things like that. So I hope that we're going to have a smooth and uh, non violent trip. What is my favorite Simpson character? I like Lisa. Why? I don't know, she's. Kind of intellectual and cool at the same time. She's funny, and then sometimes she wants to be really serious, but then again she gets funny. Top three movie deaths. That guy from the first Jurassic Park, Tyrannosaurus Rex, eats his ass right off the toilet. Letters from Iwo Jima, the Japanese guy banging the grenades off their head and then putting it in their chest and blowing up. American History X, where this guy gets his jaw rammed into a gutter. In the months leading up to the 2007 election, violent skirmishes resulted in us being sent to Nueva Ecija to oversee their election. Politics here is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and our first candidate, the incumbent mayor of Gapan City, was our first introduction to that world. We were welcomed at his house with barbed wire fences and bulletproof cars. I'm used to it. <laughs> you heard that too of your political leaders or two of your allies have been killed. Is that right? Actually, only one. Uh, uh, Mr. Manuel Tolentino was buried last Friday and I attended the wake. Ah, I think it was Thursday. And I attended the funeral against the advice of uh, some of my. Uh, uh, Friends. The opponent, did he lose, he lose his sons? Yes. In fact, uh, that happened a year ago, March. on March 20, yeah. I definitely yeah. that, yes. Besides his two sons, there are also uh, three other persons that, was, that were killed. Yes. Also other people killed as Yes, well. uh, a total of five. The death of Boy Pasquale's two sons and three loyal followers in 2006 was brutal, even by Filipino standards. During a cockfighting tournament located on Pascal's property, 20 gunmen infiltrated security, seized control of the ring and killed the five men from point blank range. Boy Pasquale, who was probably the primary target, was out of the arena at the time. Thus, his life was saved. Uh, many of us, no? uh, many including those uh, silent uh, citizens, believe that it is a vengeance against uh, uh, the family for uh, many wrongdoings, many misdeeds that they have committed against uh, so many persons. At that stage, no one had been charged with these murders. The sad truth of Filipino politics 
is that few acts of violence ever result in charges or convictions. Yet most people we talked to in Kapan did not think Mayor Eto was as innocent as he made out to us. However, our next two visits would be with the heavyweights of New Wave Asia. In one corner, the determined newcomer, Umali. And in the other corner, the heaviest of the heavyweights, the Hoson family. Family dynasties play a huge role in Filipino politics, with approximately 200 families controlling the economic and political power of the nation. In New Wave Asia, one family has reigned for 60 years, the Hosons. The current patriarch of the Hoson family is this man, Tommy Hoson. Tommy welcomed us into his house, where family pride was evident, as were the four electrical fans, which we were just too scared to ask Tommy to turn off for the camera. Tommy's 15 year run was coming to an end, and he was stepping down for one of his brothers in this election. Incredibly, his term in office was interrupted in 1995, when his brothers and himself confronted a local mayor and his men in the streets of New Wave Asiha, and violence broke out. I got involved in a shooting incident, and my opponent got killed in the shooting incident. So I was tried for murder. Fortunately, I was able to get a decision favorable to us. So, but I won from my jail. I got the biggest margin in the history of politics in the country. You from jail? Yes, I, I ran when I was in jail. Yeah. And I won by the biggest margin. How are you able to do that? Well, right? it was my kids who complained for me. Yeah. Tommy's ability to successfully run for the position as governor of Nwaiasia from prison under a murder charge required some serious explaining in the car park. Can you explain to us again how someone how he would have got into, into a position of leadership in the governor position from jail. The accusation was for murder, but then again, the, I think the case did not prosper, and then later on it was dismissed. So why were the people here voting in? It has a lot to do with the maturity of the electorate. You don't have so it's have not anything, just yeah, the Anything in the own constitution saying that if I'm uh, arrested or put in trial for murder, then I'm out of politics. If you're convicted, of a, if you're serving a sentence or something, you can't vote. But it doesn't say you can't run for office. Why would, like, for, take the states for example, they would never let Simpson, OJ no. Simpson, he got off as well, yeah. but they would never let him back in, he would be laughed at. Yeah. Why don't the Filipinos laugh at the people? I don't know, maybe because of, of, of the historicity of the Filipinos. I mean, we've been enslaved for 400 years and then after that, we welcome the Spaniards. We've been enslaved by the Americans, and then after that, we worship the Americans. It's the same. I mean, the Marcuses are still in power. If that doesn't show you what kind of political memory we Filipinos have, I don't know what will. Despite the mind-boggling statements that Tommy made in that interview, we could see the genuine warmth and affection this man had towards his family. There was no greater example of this than when his son Edward, who was running for vice governor, joined us for afternoon tea. Yet, while most of the group were charmed by Tommy's hospitality and love of family, those in the group from New Wave Asiha, particularly Meg, felt differently. Did you get angry in that interview? I, something was touched inside me. I, I, I don't I, I mean, it's more than angst maybe. It, it's, it's, from yes, it's disbelief, angst, you know, and the whole I was trying to keep quiet because he already calls me by my first name. He knows I'm from Unias Nueva Ecija and he knows that I'm a constituent. So I would, as much as I want to ask questions, I'd have to keep my mouth shut. Those are the precautions that you have to take when you're living in Nueva Ecija. Did he feel threatened by you? No, I think I feel more threatened by him. But then again, it doesn't stop me from doing what I do. As usual, the 2007 elections saw the Hosons well represented across the province. But the one stronghold that was beyond doubt was their hometown of Kazon, also known as Hosonville. Everywhere. This place is nicknamed Hosonville. That's how prominent these guys are here. 
John Lennon had come here and said that the Beatles were bigger than Hoson, he would have got in bigger trouble than he did when he said he was bigger than Jesus. The Hosons have not been challenged in Kazon as long as anyone can remember. But this was about to change. This is Umali, a man who was going to turn the one horse town of Kazon into our OK Corral. It didn't take long for us to realise that Umali was gunning hard for the Hoson dynasty. But he also shared Tommy's love for noisy air conditioners. I have already uh, dedicated my life to change uh, the, the, the political landscape of every year. Not everybody's given a chance to do that. This juggernaut of a politician is running against Tommy's brother for his old role as governor of Nueva Ecija. But he's not satisfied with just trying to beat him for governor. O'Malley finds a candidate to run against the Hosons in Kazon. Mr. Alejandro here is running uh, for mayor in Kazon town. As you know, I am very happy because somebody from Kazon finally decided to stood up and, uh, and, and uh, uh, voice the, the concern of the people. In a sense, when O'Malley does this, he is attempting to strike at the heart of the Hosons. Taking on the Hosons in Kazon comes with a price, however. Just a few days ago, uh, three armed men uh, came to his property in Quezon and shot at them, and his driver was killed. So that's he's a victim himself of the violence. You're, you're risking your life for this cause. Is, is it worth it? Why? Actually, this is my first time to join politics. So, napakalaga na ang sa akin na kahit mo ito yung maring palit ang mga kalayan, lalong lalong ang mga bayan ng Kaisong. So, gagawin natin. You look at the history of the BBC, the political history of the BBC is legal in violence. So, basically, you can, 50 years, people would like to ask for change. Undoubtedly, these were fascinating, if not scary, politicians. Little did I know that our paths would cross again in the near future. The violence prior to the 2007 election caused not just our arrival to Nueva Ecija, but the Filipino Electoral Commission sent in the military as well. I think we have recorded about 10 incidents all election-related violence incidents, wherein uh, some fatalities were reported, killed were reported. Actually, I'm praying that nothing will happen more, <laughs> because uh, this is the reason why the province of Nueva Ecija was placed under family control, because of some incidents uh, since the start of the campaign period. So this morning we talked up, I discussed the deployment during the election day how we will secure the different the 737 polling centers and how we will respond immediately without delay to any occurrences. So it appears that all systems go and as I said, I hope nothing more will happen uh, unfavorable. So you, and, uh, you got me with this uniform, I'm always on alert. <laughs> I, I sleep with my boss on. Coming from outside of New Wave Asia was supposed to ensure that the military had no bias in overseeing the election. Uh, good morning. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce first uh, members of the International Observers. The meeting of local farmers was a reminder that the election in the Philippines wasn't all about violence. The farmers informed us that there was plenty of corruption too. It was incredible to hear all the means the politicians used to purchase votes. Uh, they give a uh, half sack of rice, immunization of children. Uh, some are giving 500 pesos. They distribute water pumps and toilet bowls. Free gas will be 150 pesos. Bags of groceries and 100 pesos. Uh, 1,000 pesos, just not to vote. Okay. Uh, the, the local economy is booming every election. <laughs> yeah, that's right. 
world leaders actually have a list of people uh, who were given money for their votes. If you don't comply in the arrangement, uh, there is a tendency that they will come back to you later. Suddenly I woke to the commitment the Filipinos had to democracy. In Australia, we sometimes take elections for granted. But in the Philippines, people from all walks of life get on board. All right, we've come up here to a Catholic church and the Catholic church has organized a whole heap of, of people to become poll watchers, that is to watch and monitor the whole uh, counting process. Now I've got two guys here with me. This year I decided I decided to take part in in a in a different kind of service, and that is to to watch and to guard our votes. We want a clean election. You see, it's, it's different here in the Philippines. Do you trust the process? Do you trust the process in the past? No. It's a no. very difficult question. <laughs> but for me, no, I cannot trust the the election. No system here in the Philippines. So I would like to trust the system. I would like to trust the process. But obviously, because I said I would like to, there is doubt in me somehow. I am still an idealist and I do hope that somehow, because there are citizens out there who are willing to help, I hope that the system would work. Years of dictatorship under Marcos had taught Filipinos that the highest ideal democracy offered a voice for every person, whatever their status, was really worth fighting for. I believed because they believed, and I knew we had a part to play. But it didn't take long for reality to come crashing down. We're on. We've just been informed that there has been a shootout. That's what we are going to between two political parties. It's in progress. So we are now approaching rather cautiously to see what's happening. Of the books, it was uh, vote buying. And they were able to get the, uh, some of the soldiers called us. We've gone straight from the farm to here at the hospital where we're trying to put all the pieces together. Now what we know is that two congressmen's goons or military men clashed at that farm we just come from. And the upshot as it was is that the police came rather aggressively after receiving a phone call and what they found was two injured people who were shot. They found 600,000 pesos and they found some illegal firearms. Now, that's about as good as it gets at this stage. They won't let us in the hospital to talk to the two guys who have been shot because, well, they've just got here. So uh, we'll wait and see, what, see what's going down. Um, but this is kind of Filipino politics at its worst. Uh, it involves fraud, illegal arms, potentially vote buying and violence. As usual, despite having numerous officials on the scene, no one will get charged over these offences. After a heartfelt morning with the people, this visit to the shootout brought us back to earth heavily. Who knew what tomorrow's election was going to bring? All right, here we are on election day. Big day, May the 14th. Here we are outside the booths where all the Filipinos are turning up to vote. Quite a few people here and it's very, very hot. 
Not surprisingly, our first call out that day was to Kazon, and it involved our two big guns. All right, we've been doing a bit of travelling today, and we are now heading back to Kazon because the congressman is trying to get into the middle of enemy territory, and apparently it's a very, very heated situation. People are actually forming some kind of blockade or something to stop him from getting in. So we're going to go and see what that's all about. So we should be there in about 20 minutes, I think. Okay, so we're just outside Kazon now. Um, and looks like the situation between Omali and the people of this town has been diffused. What we understand at this point, without any clear facts, is that um, people created a human blockade in front of the Omali camp and then created another one behind them, essentially trapping them in. Um, and uh, apparently there are lots of threats, there are lots of uh, waving of guns perhaps, we're not sure. And apparently they had the Hosons on the phone, all they needed was the word and they could have, it could have ended right there and then. Nothing like that happened, they, they got away. That's what we're hearing at the moment, may be true, may not be true. Um, we'll see what we can find out as time goes by. But Umali wasn't finished with Kazon or us quite yet. We decided to go to our other area of concern, Gapon. See how Eto and Pasquale were behaving. But uh, so far today, it's, it's, we've probably got a couple hours before the polls finish. And uh, by the looks of things, everything looks all right to me. There's been uh, that isolated incident in down at Kazon, and uh, that's about it. But it should really heat up when they close, because that's when everyone's going to start trying to fix the election. That's when everyone's going to try to cheat, grab the ballot boxes, etc. So we'll see how we go when that happens. But I don't think any of these candidates have an environmental platform. Imagine. They're having a hard time trying to get all the boxes into the chipneys with all the people who have been paid to watch to watch the votes. They don't want to be separated with the ballot boxes, but there are no enough there's no enough space for both the ballot boxes and all the other poll watchers. It's amusing. It's a bit silly, I guess, that it's happening this way and shows you how inefficient the whole process is. But in terms of fraud, or it's not that alarming. This is this is the Philippines. For you. Chaotic, but above board. Since the morning's human blockades, our two rival parties had behaved themselves throughout the afternoon. But as night fell and the counting began, the texts, phone calls and word of mouth started to reach us. The games had just begun, and again, the focus was on Kazon. We retreated to a local service station to discuss. Uh, here's the latest update. Uh, according to the, there are countings happening in the northern part of the Nueva Isla. The, the trend is that Umali and Tarupa are winning. Now Schubert is saying that you shouldn't go to Quezon because they'd kill for Quezon because that might be the only place where they will win. Something's happening in Quezon, there are men in bonnets there. Okay, so that is very, very scary for us because when men are wearing bonnets, they tend to do something real bad. With rumours circulating that Hoson supporters were terrorising Kazon vote counters, we were stuck with a dilemma. Go to Kazon? Not go to Kazon? Or Woody's left field suggestion, which was, ring Tommy Hoson and tell him we were going to Kazon without ever intending to. What everyone's been saying for the last four days, that's, oh, violence is going to stop because we're around. Well, maybe if he thinks we're around, then, you know, it's just maybe playing a card without actually playing a card. Okay, calling the bluff on Pasa. Uh, this is really, I mean, they, they, they've been politicians for 50 years. They're good strategists. They know everything in and out of politics. They know when it's a bluff, when it's not. I, I think that's something that we're all considering. We face the alternative of doing nothing. What if we call the police? Just ask them that we're hearing reports about what's going on in Quezon. Yes. Yeah. 
I think that would be a better idea. And then if it doesn't work out, I, I, I want to try. I want to use both the old channels now. So, so where do we go? Let's go to the police station and verify what we've been hearing around. Yeah. The decision to visit the police seemed wise to me, and in Australia or Sweden, it probably would have been. But this is the Philippines, where alliances are made and few in authority can be trusted. Meg led Lars and myself into the police station, where we found the sergeant enjoying a meal with his military friends. When Meg mentioned Kazon, the sergeant started to speak in their local Filipino dialect, leaving Lars and I clueless. It became obvious to us that whatever Cabellis had said made a significant impact on Meg. By just this body language, I've, I've been, I, I, I'm assessing him already and I think that he's trying to intimidate. Okay, he's trying to intimidate and then he, he, he's actually asking from where NGO are you? And I was trying to say, no, I'm not connected to any NGO. I, I'm, with, you know, I'm with Compaq. Uh, he doesn't want to believe. And then... All of a sudden, Ate Nenning said that I was from Munoz. And then when, when he heard Munoz, he said, you're from CLSU. Yes. Yeah. Because CLSU has this <laughs> history of activism. Meg being identified by the police as an activist was a critical moment for her. But foolishly, all we wanted to do was to get out to watch the vote counting, particularly in Kazon. I think that we have to... It's business as usual, and we need to do what we're supposed to do. We've done everything in our yeah. power. We need to keep on listening to how it's happening in Kuzon, in Kuzon. Um, But I think we need to um, stick to our guns, and I think that, um, I think that personally, you probably are a little rattled because you're at the end. Yes. Yeah. Oh, wait. Yeah. Okay, so this is all coming from, from, from the objective of the mission, I'm sure, because you're here really to, to observe. But then again, uh, that's why you are partnered with local contacts because the local contacts knows the place. They know how to assess the things that are happening. Is, is there anything that any of the members of the group has been doing or saying that makes you feel like we don't appreciate? That? No, I, I've been, I've been, say for example, really uh, telling you that uh, we can't really truly uh, trust the police. Mm -hmm. And then being not really, you know, just I just said that not to, you know, cause ah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. just so to light, you know, just because I know everybody's kind of feeling very yeah. heavy yes. about it. This is the politics of Nueva Ecija. Even though we conceded Kazon was dangerous, Meg was adamant no one was going to leave the motel that night. If only I knew then what I know now, particularly about the issue that upset Meg the most, being identified by the police as an activist. He said, you're from CLSU. Yes. Because CLSU has this history of activism. This is CLSU, the university in Minos, where as a student many years ago, Meg got involved in political activism. While many people worldwide have their first taste of political activism as university students, most don't end up like this. Since 2001, there has been a surge in executions of unarmed political activists, union officials, journalists, and even religious ministers throughout the Philippines, including Nueva Ecija. Most of us priests are receiving death threats. In fact, my former my former assistant had uh, received heavy, heavy death threats. So we need to pull him out from this place. Some have put the number as high as 900 murders. Who do human rights groups hold responsible? The very people who were there to protect the people of New Wave at Sia during the elections. The military. What we failed to recognize was that the Philippines was a dangerous country for people like Meg all the time even after we foreign election observers had left.
if we needed any proof that the group had been affected by the Kazon incident, it was confirmed in the presence of Joe Sal the very next morning. Overnight, Meg had sent an SOS to compact officials in Manila, and he appeared. First morning after the election, and the team is being joined by a security person, something like that from Manila. And the reason behind that is because our local leader is getting very nervous, and Poson is losing across the board, and this is a bad thing she feels for anyone who's connected with this election because she really feels that she could be in the line for backlash um, after we've all left. Meg was not alone in her prediction of post-election cheating and violence. There were 13 more votes or ballots cast than there were voters registered there. Oh my God, she's getting good. The message is saying that have the place where you will be buried ready. Did he just get that? Yes. Just now? And then the situation went from bad to worse. We're receiving text messages right now which say that according to bulatlat.com, that's a news, you know, it's a news website, um, there are reports that there are around 500 people who are mobilizing in Gimba. Iona's reference to the people mobilizing in Gimba points to another important aspect of Filipino elections post-election retribution violence. Every Filipino politician thinks they are going to win the election. When the inevitable occurs and some realize they are going to lose, then there can only be one conclusion. The winners cheated. Now the best way to deal with cheating is to send your supporters onto the streets for a good old fashioned riot. The rising retribution violence was now becoming very real for the team and added another layer of tension to the group. In response to this development, Jocelle brought us back to the motel for the latest word from Manila. Even the national headquarters is uh, suggesting that uh, we, we pull out now just to be on the safer side. The retribution that the people are that the people that we talked to this afternoon were talking about is already happening. Already one village uh, chairman has already been killed here in Cabanatuan today. Today? Yes, so things are heating up. What, when we say we have to leave today and pull out already, or, or is there a time that we're talking about? What we've done so far, what you've seen is the, um, the information and the footage and the documentation we've done. Have we achieved what we've been asked to, to do? Have we done what's expected of us? Yeah, we have, we have enough. Uh, material and ex experience and also insights to, uh, to accomplish what we came here for. We felt exactly the same as we did on election night, except this time yeah. we were leaving. As we left New Wave Asia on our four hour trip back to the capital, we felt frustrated and unsatisfied. We seemed to leave the province with more questions than answers. Several months uh, since we've been the Philippines and UA Brasilia, and I'm here just catching up on the latest results on the internet. And um, in UA Brasilia, there's already been a couple of deaths, strangely enough, at a cockfighting ring. Um, and there's been even more deaths across the Philippines uh, connected to the elections. What I'm really looking for and trying to find out is what's happened to our friends, um, those in UA Brasilia and those who are not. Um, I can talk quite freely and often to Iona and Wacky on MSN, but I cannot get any communication with Meg. And uh, that worries me a little bit. I don't know whether she doesn't want to talk to us or whether something's happened. Um, but I, I, I hope to find out in time what's happened to her. I'm not sure whether I'll be able to find out here in Australia, however, by the sounds of things.
It took me two years to get back to this fanatic city. My goals on returning to the Philippines were twofold. Investigate the aftermath of the 2000 election in Nueva Ecija and find Meg, who despite all attempts, could not be contacted. But before I went back to Nueva Ecija, there was one person I had to talk to. Iona is an assistant to a Filipino senator. But there has been more going on in her life than just politics. Well, basically I'm a mother now, as you know. I have a little 10-month-old baby girl. And that's, you know, that's a major thing for anyone, parenthood, motherhood. Unfortunately though, political violence did not cease for Iona when she left New Wave Asia. The violence came right there to her very workplace. Eight or nine in the evening or, or so, and we heard this loud boom, and people started running in, and people were starting started screaming, my bomba, my bomba, which means there was a bomb, there's a bomb, so people should just stay where they were. In this very location, four people died and 11 were wounded from a bomb hidden in a motorbike. And it, it was pretty terrifying. And then after a few minutes, people started bringing in, you know, the wounded. No one took responsibility and typically no one was charged. Having reconnected, Iona and I turned our attention to the 2007 election. How did you see or how did you perceive the dynamics of the group? I, I, I'm not really sure if we knew what we were getting into when we started it. What are your concerns for Meg? I would hate to be in her shoes actually since her safety was really on the line and her personal safety. She was from that place, the place, the, precisely the reason why we were there because it's a hot spot. So it's very understandable that she became very personally, you know, emotionally involved in the whole thing. Iona's deepest concern was still the silence of Meg. She was very keen that I find her. But until I could track down Meg, there were politicians to speak to. Seems good will stop. Since we were last in New Over Asia. Eton Natividad reclaimed his mayoral position for a third consecutive time over his rival, the grieving boy Pasquale. But early in 2009, it seemed Pasquale could get the last laugh when, in an unprecedented development, Eto was charged for masterminding the killing of Pasquale's sons in 2006. In the heavyweight division, Rumali was indeed successful in beating Hosongs in the race for governor of Nueva Ecija, the first to do so in 59 years. But Tommy's son Edward claimed the vice governor role, and reports were that he was making life hell for Romali. Predictably, the Hosons won Kazon in a landslide. But I was keen to chase up what happened there on election day, particularly with Romali and that human blockade. Pasquale, Eto, Romali and the Hosons. I was keen to speak to them again, but uh, they were not so keen on speaking to me. A signature, so they won't see me. These politicians won't see me unless there's a signature. The letter had my email address, it has my mobile phone, my home number, and my home address. That's not, that's not good enough. All right, no worries. I don't know what these guys are about, I really don't. I don't know, maybe cultural thing, maybe it's just cultural etiquette I haven't followed, but. But success finally came with a meeting with the elusive Boy Pasquale. Celebrations, however, were short-lived. Boy Pasquale was reluctant to speak on camera. So we showed him what Mayor Eto said about his son's murders and himself back when we interviewed him in 2007. Many of us, no? uh, many including those uh, silent uh, citizens, believe that it is a uh, vengeance against uh, uh, the family. He wasn't impressed to say the least, but instead of going to interview, Boy found us this lady, Mrs. Perez. Her husband worked side by side with Mayor Eto in Town Hall until 2004. That is when, according to Mrs. Perez, Eto had him killed. The, 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 the day he come, he goes to the market with me to bring me to the stall. When he go, goes back, there he was ambushed. I go to the house of Eto. I talk to him. 
Pare has no money. Then why did you make him a, just a like, like a lamp offered to, to you? He just answered nothing. Pale face. No blood in any part of his body. How many people do you think have died due to Ma'ato? Uh, he has killed, uh, uh, I think, more than a hundred. He has made people suffer almost 80% of the people of Gapan. At present, the reason why I'm happy because he has got his punishment. It probably goes without saying that the Kapan election is going to be hotly contested in 2010, with rumours that things are already beginning to heat up. And fortunately for me, I met someone who knew someone who knows Vice Governor Edward Hoson. How did you see the 2007 election? We had reports of uh, massive vote buying uh, by, uh, by, by our opponents. We heard about, when we were here, we heard about controversy in Kazon on the day of the election and the night of election. And apparently they had the Hosons on the phone. All they needed was the word and they could have, they could have ended it right there and then. That he shouldn't go to Kazon because they'd kill for Kazon because that might be the only place where they will win. Actually, in terms of violence, uh, uh, Kazon was on everybody's radar. The candidate for governor at that time, Umali, went went to Quezon. Uh, nothing happened. Uh, where most people were thinking that uh, <laughs> uh, that uh, war would erupt between yeah. between the Hosons and the Umalis because uh, he went to our hometown. But uh, nothing happened because uh, we respected that uh, this person uh, wants to run for governor against us. So that's that's the essence of the, democ the democracy. So so be it. I really wanted to hear Umali's side of that story. But would he speak to us? Edward assured us that unlike the Hosons, who are men of the people, Umali was too aloof and he wouldn't see us. Even though Edward was political point scoring against Umali, there was something different about this man. We had been told that Edward represented a new generation of Filipino politician. More educated, more sophisticated than his predecessors which made his personal invitation to this arena somewhat of a shock. We were uh, fortunate enough to get there early for a guided tour. I was told that big time politicians were coming to Edward's Coliseum that night. So I asked if Umali was one of those politicians. If Umali is here going to them, Umali kill all oh. night. Okay. The first rule of cockfighting is there is no cockfighting. The second rule of cockfighting, there is no cockfighting. This arena explained to me so much about the dynamics of gaining political power in the Philippines. It revealed how through events like cockfighting and illegal betting rackets, families and candidates managed to raise money and loyalty from the people to maintain their small kingdom and their power. As for interviewing Umali, well, we might have to wait until the next election when he wants to start campaigning again. But at the end of the day, there is but one person in Nueva Ecija I wanted to talk to. And I found her. All right, so Meg, what have you been doing for the last two years? I've been living my life, just your normal average life. I'm actually studying now. Two years behind you now, since the election, what are your reflections of the 2007 experience? It was, it was, I was nervous at times, but I wanted to be part of the election ever since. I wanted to, to play a role, not just to vote, but I wanted to be a part of it. There was that moment that night when you really felt that we were in danger and that you were really quite worried. Do you think you were justified in feeling what you were feeling? And do you think you were justified in the decisions you made? Honestly, uh, looking back at it, I, I think I, I did, I did. We were really in danger at that time. Very few things give me fear, honestly. I'm not, I'm not easily afraid of anything. But at that time, at that night, 
knowing the background of Philippine election, I honestly think, I, honest, I honestly believe that night that we were in danger. Has there been any consequences for you personally? I, I am more careful after election with what I say, with what I do, with where I go. It has given me something to think about. What is your dream for the people of the Philippines? I don't know. I'm somewhat of an idealist, but my dream is that I hope someday people would feel responsible for the single vote that they cast during election. I, I hope that they see the vote, the single vote that they cast as the road to, to hope to, to, to a better Philippines later on. That's what I hope. After seeing Maggie and Iona and having such an interesting conversation with Eduardo, I began to feel okay about our role in the 2007 elections. As we flew away, I began thinking that maybe this country, the Philippines, was one step closer to finding its feet. But man, did I get that wrong. On the 28th of September 2009, Typhoon Ketsana hit the Philippines, and in particular, Metro Manila, dumping a month's rain in just six hours. The weak infrastructure was unable to deal with this onslaught. 468 people were reported dead. Many drowned, but others picked up waterborne diseases from rat urine penetrating the skin. Amongst this flood is the tragic story of Rosita Malati, whom we had met in the strip club. During the downpour, 18-year-old Rosita gave birth to her baby, Rosie. After bleeding profusely, Rosita went to the hospital, thanks to the fundraising efforts of her sisters. However, when the funds ran out, the treatment ceased, and Rosita's life succumbed to an infection. Not even Rosita knew who the father of her child was, except some client at the club. A malnourished Rosie now lives with her aunties and her grandmother in Manila. The point is this, if a country's political leaders are going to spend money on private armies, buying votes, and many other forms of corruption and deceit. How much time and money do they have to create strong infrastructure for their people? How can politicians obsessed with maintaining family dynasties create healthcare systems that support their poorest of citizens? But as far as direct political violence was concerned, the worst was yet to come. In the run-up to the 2010 ballot, Mindanao witnessed one of the worst election-related massacres in Filipino history. 57 people were butchered in cold blood, including over 34 journalists. All they were trying to do was register a candidate for the 2010 elections. So we're just putting the final touches on ballots and bullets and post-production here. And um, as we did, I just got this letter the other day from the Philippines. Greetings of peace and solidarity from the Philippines. We are very excited to inform you that the third election observation project will be implemented this year in May 2010. Hopefully you and your organisation will be able to participate as well. If you're interested in participating, please do not hesitate to contact us. We hope to see you in the Philippines very soon. Hmm.